you. Hello, internet viewers. I'm the Fairly Odd Gamer. As I mentioned in my last review, I be talking about an animated show from a TV network that I never even talked about before. Until now. As you can tell from the title of the video, and of course the shirt I'm wearing, I think you have an idea on what I will be reviewing. And since I reached 400 subscribers not too long ago, I thought I'd do something special in addition. So with that being said, I'll be dedicating a whole month to a well-beloved show from Cartoon Network. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Samurai Jack Month. Since 1992, Cartoon Network will primarily broadcast animated shows, including reruns of classic shows, as well as original shows such as The Powerpuff Girls, Johnny Bravo, Curse the Cowardly Dog, and Ed, Ed and Eddie, among others. However, on August 10, 2001, a brand new show would change how we see children's animation on American TV. That show is Samurai Jack. It was created by a guy named Jindy Tartakovsky after his enormous success on an earlier Cartoon Network show, Dexter's Laboratory. With combined inspiration from his love for Samurai, as well as David Carradine's Kung Fu, Samurai Jack premiered as a three-part TV movie simply titled The Premier Movie. It was groundbreaking with an amazing art style and completely story-driven. The show initially ran until 2004 with four incredible seasons, but not until 13 years later when the fifth and final season aired on Adult Swim. The show became an immediate hit for both critics and audiences, even though I never saw the show when it aired, I managed to do something that I'd never done before. Ben's watched the entire show from beginning to end. I was captivated by not only the art style and action, but the very first episode has about 10 minutes with no dialogue. That's unbelievable. If you can carry a story with no dialogue for 10 minutes, then clearly you deserve a medal. Now, I'm sure that some of you, or even most of you, have never even heard of or seen Samurai Jack. If you have seen it, great! But if not, allow me to give you a quick premise. A young warrior named Jack is given a magic sword, or katana, by his father, the Emperor, which he uses to defeat a shape-shifting demon named Aku, who spreads evil across the kingdom. But just before Jack lands the finishing blow, Aku throws a time portal flinging Jack to the future where Aku rules everything. Because of this, Jack has to do everything he can to return to the past and undo the future of Aku. And of course, with a show being this popular, you expect to have video game time. And thankfully, there are some. But for this month, I'm only going to talk about the Samurai Jack games that are only exclusive for consoles. And first up, we have Samurai Jack The Shadow of Aku for the Nintendo GameCube. Is the game as good as the show it was based on? Let's find out. After seeing that it's a property of Cartoon Network, we see that the game was published by Sega and was developed by Warner Bros. Interactive Entertainment and Adrenium Games, part of Amaze Entertainment, a company best known for Azric Prize's Parathia for the original Xbox. After pressing the start button, we get a choice of difficulty with Easy, Medium, and Hard. Since I am a veteran of action platformers, I'm going to go with Medium. The game starts with a quote from the Emperor taken from the show, which is actually a nice touch. Nothing worth having is easily attained. Sometimes you must fight for what is yours, and for what you believe in. It is not one's outward brawn, but rather one's inner strength that makes them mighty. We see Jack climbing up a mountain with rocks falling over the widescreen bars as he's being saved by a fly frog thing. Thank you, my green friend. No need to thank me, but I must warn you not to go that way. Aku, the master of darkness, has taken over my village. Aku, Aku. By the way, is it just me, or does Jack look like Akira from the original Virtual Fire, another game by Sega? I ask this because the graphics in this game are pretty similar to any 3D tie-in game based on a 2D cartoon, cellular graphics and all. But at least the levels look similar to those from the show, so that's something. In regards to gameplay, Jack's control is fine and dandy. But that's when you begin to realize something odd about the controls. Any experienced GameCube player should know that A is jump and B is attack. However, in this game, it's the exact opposite. B is jump, double jump if you tap it twice, and A is your sword attack. 
but you can also attack with X. In addition, you can gain powers by destroying Aku crates, and some of these powers include sushi for extra health and armor for extra protection. Every time you pick up armor, an armor meter will appear above your health meter. Even though you won't suffer any damage while wearing armor, any hit you take removes one dot from your armor meter. If you die, you're either sent back to the beginning of the stage or last safe checkpoint, which is represented by a kingdom flag. On the bright side, you have infinite lives in this game. Also, you see that blue meter underneath your health meter? That's your Zen energy meter. You can gain Zen by defeating enemies or finding these Zen icons hidden in a box. By holding R, you can activate Sakai attack mode, which allows the action to slow down. It's very useful when you're being gained by a bunch of enemies. Here's another cool thing. If you perform a string of attacks without getting hit, you'll activate Auto Sakai mode. It's the same as normal Sakai mode, except Jack doesn't lose any Zen energy. You can also unlock combo attacks by finding these combo scrolls, which reveals the exact button controls to unleash that attack. In order to perform these combo attacks, you have to hold L and then perform a specific button combination. Do a barrel roll! You can also hold L to block your attacks, which is very useful if you want to progress your way through the game. Throughout each mission, you'll have to rescue all the locals imprisoned by Aku, whether in cages or in a single cell. If you rescue 30 locals in each realm, you'll be rewarded with blade magic, allowing them to switch from a standard blade to a more powerful blade by pressing left and right on the control pad. These magical blades can range from flame, crystal, and electric. But here's the catch. Every time you inflict damage onto an enemy, your Zen energy meter will deplete. Furthermore, you have to find rocks that are scattered around the level. Why do you have to collect them? More on that in a moment. Anyway, Jack has to make his way to the village while defeating enemies, collecting relics, talking to locals as well as freeing them, and find these ancient strolls that contain advice from his father, the Emperor. It's pretty much a tutorial level, so nothing much to add. The level ends once you cross the bridge, and you'll see how many relics you've collected as well as how many villages you've rescued throughout the level. Once that's over with, you then make your way to the village square. Think of it as the game's hub world. What I like about it is that each level is close to one another, and you're never confused about which mission you have to do next. Oh, and remember those relics I just talked about? Well, you have to pay relics in order to increase Jack's powers, whether it's health, zen, or damage. Just simply walk up to a shrine, meditate, and you'll become more powerful than ever imagined. So the villagers tell Jack that they're frightened because their king was taken by Aku's robot minions, and it's up to Jack to rescue the king. It's here where we first find these munitions in the Aku statues. What are these munitions, you ask? They're revealed to be throwing stars or shurikens, which you can throw by pressing Y, and arrows for your bow. By holding Z, Jack can draw his bow and press A to shoot an arrow at your target enemy. Yeah, did I mention? Enemies have target markers that also act as their health bars, but Jack can automatically lock onto that target enemy until it dies. It's also the first time we see these spider robots that shoot their own projectiles which Jack can deflect with a sword. After venturing through the village, Jack enters a temple and it's here where he finds the king. Jack refuses to take the treasure, but he tells the king about the time portal that will take him back to the past. A portal? My priest would know of such a thing. Where is he? Aku has imprisoned him somewhere in the city. Go, rescue my people, and we will help you find your portal. Many thanks. Jack makes his way to the courtyard where he comes across these beetle drones which actually looks very similar to the show. Eventually, Jack encounters a giant Aku statue held by three robes that Jack can destroy. Also, I forgot to mention that Jack can even take damage from a large height. You heard right, there is fall damage in this game, I don't know why. After destroying the statue, Jack makes his way to a burning building. This is the level where I first encounter these key master robots with saw blades for hands. Unlike other robots, he has to slash his back at a big red glowing button. Once it's destroyed, it releases a key which he uses to unlock the door to the burning building. I do want to point out that if Jack takes enough damage, he'll be seen without his kanji scratched and bruised. It's actually a nice touch in my opinion. Also, while inside the burning building, touching the lava can instantly kill you no matter how much armor or health you have. After exiting the burning building, the metal door opens as the king tells Jack that the priest is through that door. Jack then finds the priest locked behind bars, as Jack has to fight two giant robots that somewhat bear resemblance to the Keymaster robot in which they can only be heard from the back. Let me tell you right now, I don't like battling these robots at all. You can't even imagine how many times I've died trying to beat this boss. By the way, it's the same level where you first find these Zen crests that give Jack a full amount of Zen energy. 
So after Jack defeats the two giant robots, he then frees the priest. And just like the king, Jack tells the priest about the time portal. A time portal? I don't know what you're talking about. But the grove on the next mountain is ruled by a great tree spirit. Speak to him. He knows everything. Many thanks. Does Jack say that every time somebody helps him? Anyway, the priest tells Jack that the quickest way to the tree spirit is to take a path that leads to the world hub, which is the main hub world of the game. So, wouldn't that technically make the village square a sub hub world? Speaking of which, Jack makes his way to the next sub world, the forest where he has to find the tree spirit. Before I move on, I'd like to point out that each hub world gives Jack stronger armor with more hit points. So back to the forest. Jack runs into three tree men, or gnomes as the game calls it, who tell Jack that Oscar's robots are burning the forest, the tree spirit is hiding, and they're scared because they don't have a leader. Be our leader! Yay! While doing their impressions of Kermit the Frog. So one of the gnomes tells Jack that the greenhouse is their livelihood and it must be protected. And that's exactly what he does. It's also the level where I first encounter these fire bots that shoot fireballs, flamethrower drones which are pretty much self-explanatory, and these tree spirits are pretty simple to beat. However, they can dig underground and pop up at random spots, so keep an eye out for that. There are also these mushrooms that emit a harmful gas when you get too close to them. After he makes his way to the top, they beat more minions and the level is done. Another thing I forgot to mention earlier is that you can complete any mission you'd like to, if it's unlocked. In addition, you can fight these frog things that pop out of the water, which can easily be defeated on dry land, avoid boulders, fight more minions, including one with double samurai swords, and eventually he finds the tree spirit, a magical acorn. And as always, Jack asks the tree spirit where he can find a time portal in order to stop Aku. This leads to what is probably the best moment in the entire game. Very well. <laughs> yep, the little green-eyed squirrel is the tree spirit. Come on, you'd laugh too if you saw this. So after that, Jack encounters the next boss, the foreman. It's a simple boss battle. All you do is avoid his attacks and slash his backside. Once that's over with, the tree spirit tells Jack where the portal is. You will find your portal buried deep in the heart of a volcanic mountain, guarded by the living dead. Find that portal, warrior. Free my people once and for all. I will. Thank you, great tree spirit. By the way, there have been moments where the game would freeze on a loading screen. In other words, the game crashed. So what did I do? Reset the GameCube, start up the game, load up my save file, and automatically get me to the next level without having to go through the hub world again. At least the game didn't fully crash. So back to the story. Jack makes his way to the volcanic mountain where he once again runs into these fly frog creatures who now tells Jack about a certain treasure hidden inside the mountain. But in order to get this treasure, Jack has to free a certain prisoner of Aku, which happens to be the archaeologist. After traveling deep into the mountain, Jack frees the archaeologist and, of course, tells him about the time portal. You mean you want to change all of history? Young man, I'm an archaeologist. You can't go back and undo my life's work. But I could end centuries of tyranny and bring peace to the world. What about my dissertation? You're right. Get us out of here and I'll help you. And that's exactly what Jack does. He saves more villagers while defeating more robot minions and gets the map tablet, which he then gives to the archaeologist. The tablet reveals that a treasure room is underneath a lake of lava and the drainage system is hidden behind a force field, which Jack ultimately penetrates. By the way, did I mention that lava instantly kills you? Anyway, this is the level where you're introduced to these sections where you have to use Sakai mode to pass through these lasers and avoid these red spotlights. If you're spotted, then one of Aku's minions would spawn and you have to defeat it in order to move forward. It's also the first world where we encounter these robots that not only shoot projectiles that can be deflected, but also shoot projectiles that can hurt you even if you try to deflect them. So Jack makes his way to the control room, disables the security system, and takes the elevator down. It's here where he fights the next boss in the game, a giant molten lava robot. All you do is avoid its attacks, as well as falling rocks, and then you damage him on the front. Pretty simple, except it can turn into a boulder that chases after Jack, which is very difficult to dodge. After a few hits, 
Jack destroys the robot, but the time portal is nowhere to be seen. Except on a train. Jack chases after it, but to no avail because the train tracks are electrified according to the archaeologist. So where exactly does the train go? Aku City. Aku City. Then the portal is already in his grasp. So Jack has to make his way to Aku City while once again fighting more of Aku's minions and saving captured kids. Also, is it just me, or do these kids sound like a teenage version of Hux Gamer? Dude! Speaking of which, Jack runs into a few kids who need his help. From what you may ask? Aku forces them to play video games that rot their brains into mush. Video games? Yeah, you know, you pretend you're a great warrior and you can pull off all these awesome moves and cut robots into pieces and it rocks, man! It's so cool! Except, it melts your brain. Yeah. Yeah, but video games can't really rot their brains. Can they? Hey dude, did you say video games? Oh hey Axe, what's up? Nothing much. But is it really true about video games actually rotting your brain? Not necessarily. Although, I heard that video games can affect your brain depending on what game you're playing. Whoa. That's interesting, dude. It is. And personally, I play video games just for fun. So do I, gamer. So do I. Anyway, I just want to see what's up. Later, dude! So Jack finds out about these video games come from a designer who lives deep inside the sewers. Alright, let's give that designer a piece of our minds. Jack ventures through the sewers, defeating enemies and all, when he finds out that the game designer was Xtor, the same guy responsible for the Ultra Robots. It turns out he was imprisoned by Aku and was forced to make the torturous and horrible brain rotting games. And you know the drill by now. Jack tells Xtor about the time portal which Aku took to the city. I can stop the video games and find the time portal for you at the same time. You can? Yes! Follow me! Fly. Obvious not to Jerry Lewis is obvious. Jack then makes his way to a gladiator cage where he has to slash his way through an ongoing slaughter of robot minions. But suddenly the Scotsman appears. Scotsman? My old friend! I don't know what you're talking about! You do not remember me? We fought bounty hunters together. I helped you rescue your wife. I have a gimli who dollared for a husband with a scrawny reaper sidekick. I'd be better off saving myself! Forgive me. Yes, I inserted clips in the show in between to once again prove that you have to see the show in order to fully understand this game. Also, before I move on, let's talk about the voice acting. A majority of voice actors for the show reprise the roles in the game such as Phil Lamar as Samurai Jack, John DiMaggio as the Scotsman, Jeff Bennett as Xtor, and the late actor Mako as Aku, which we'll get to later. Anyway, the battle against the Scotsman is pretty simple. All you do is simply hit one button over and over again until you win. Look, look, look! And then it ends. The Scotsman and Jack are friends again. Yeah! But there's also a section in the level where you have to platform your way on floating cars, but try not to fall into a bottomless abyss. Once that's done, Xor tells Jack that Aku keeps all his games in a central computer, in the basement of a clock tower. Once there, Jack has to find his way inside and deactivate the transmitter so Xor can delete the games. In other words, FIND THE COMPUTER ROOM! The downside is that Xor somehow set up this self-destruct sequence. Thankfully, there's no time limit in this game. Like the lasers, you have to use Sakai mode to get through these barriers. However, if you run out of Zen energy, you have to grind for more Zen by defeating robots. Now this part actually confused me. I thought I was trapped and I had nowhere to go. That is until I found out you have to Sakai your way through these fan blades. Makes sense, I guess. Jack then takes an elevator to his time portal, which leads to the final level of the game, Aku's Tower. This is by far the best looking level in this game because it's one of the only few stages that's actually replicated beautifully. Anyway, you have to scale Aku's Tower while slashing through an onslaught of enemies. Jack enters another time portal, where he then has to fight Mad Jack. For those who don't know, Mad Jack is the embodiment of Jack's inner darkness, but lost his physical form due to Jack finding his inner peace. And the way you slash Mad Jack enough times as Mad Jack flows to one of these Aku screens, which then Jack has to destroy. Destroy two more screens and the level's over, right? Nope, you still got Aku to fight. If you thought Jack's model was bad, then wait till you see Aku's model. So, Samurai Jack, you have come to find your time portal. 
It is Samurai. That is the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in the entire game. But can we just talk about this? The way Aku looked in the show was amazing. Incredible art style and everything. But look at Aku's model. It's pixelated and ugly and ugh, just awful. So Jack stops Aku from destroying the time portal, but Aku calls upon tiny Aku warriors, which Jack defeats. But this time, you have to use the Kai mode as much as possible to even get a crack at defeating those guys. After defeating them, you then battle Aku. You can slash him in his normal form, but that won't do you any good. But Aku, being the shape-shifting demon he is, can morph into a dragon and spit fireballs, as well as a... flying anglerfish? It results in Aku bashing into a wall, and that's your chance to attack Aku. As well as more mini Aku warriors. After slashing Aku enough times, Jack is about to land the final blow. Again. But Jack falls into the inner depths of the earth when suddenly... Scotsman X Machina. What? Who was that? Yep, the Scotsman shoots a missile at Aku. Nice dirt face, Jack. Causing Aku to explode, I think. As the Scotsman rides off with Jack. Thank you, old friend. Don't mention it! Though I thought you could have used your dress as a parachute. I will have to remember that. Be sure you do. I don't want to be bailing you out of trouble all the time, you wee gal. And that's why the Scotsman is my favorite character in the show, being the Game Awards you a Chronicle, which happens to be the backgrounds used from the show. So how come the sketches and model chronicles are still locked? Well, get this. You have to beat the game in a specific difficulty in order to unlock those chronicles. Therefore, Beating the game in easy mode unlocks the sketches chronicle, and beating the game in hard mode unlocks the models chronicle. As much as I like to see the other two chronicles, playing through the game one time is just enough for me. So how does Shino of Aku hold to the show's popularity? It's okay. I appreciate the effort that was put into this game, but I just don't think it works in my opinion. The overall graphics look pretty bland. Even though I love the design of some of the levels, such as Aku City and Aku's Tower. And some of the models didn't really capture the style of the show, especially Aku's pixelated model. But at least they tried to have them look like the show, which is fine by me. I have some mixed opinions about the gameplay though. For one, the basic controls are a bit off, primarily because the A and B buttons were switched. But after a few levels, you'll probably get the hang of it. I actually like the game's combat, especially the combo attacks and Sakai attack mode. Personally, I think anything in slow motion makes it more epic. In addition, the checkpoint system is pretty good, and I love the armor power-ups. While it is a bit costly using relics to meditate for a power upgrade, it actually is worth it in the end. The music in this game is pretty good too, because they actually managed to get the composers from the show. And it's one of the only few things in the game that actually does feel like the show. Overall, Shadow of Aku is a game I wouldn't necessarily recommend to those who are not familiar with the show, but I would recommend this game to those who are not only familiar with the show, but also willing to play a Samurai Jack game for the GameCube. Personally, I would recommend watching the show rather than playing the game. But at least I still hope because I still have another Samurai Jack game to review. And I think you probably know what that is. I'm the Fairly Odd Gamer, and I wish you all good luck for the rest of your day, or night, wherever you are. Take care, everyone. Watch out. How's it going, dudes? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon if you want to get notified for upcoming videos. Also, be sure to check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you'd like to have one of my character buddies do a short video for you, well guess what? Now you can because I'm opening video commissions to anyone that may be interested, especially during the ongoing pandemic. And here's a little snippet of what it may look like. Let's give it a try! <laughs> Isn't it adorable? Speaking of which, here's one of my buddies right now to finish out the video. Hello everyone! I'm the Grinch. I'm here to let you know that you can support the Fairly Odd Gamer on Patreon. As a supporter, you can chat with other patrons, fans, and those who took part in the channel, have your name featured in the credits, and even watch some bonus content such as a sneak peek and quite possibly 
an early showing of an upcoming game review. Now, it is my honor to give out today's special Patreon shoutout, and a grinchy one at that, to Alexander Bone, also known as Wisdom Tote. So once again, thank you all so much for watching the video and supporting the channel. And I hope you all have a wonderful and merry holiday season. Because if one thing's for sure, mine most definitely will not.